Okay, hi guys, and um, thanks for tuning back in. Um, so last class we recapped the Russian Revolution and we talked about the massive famine of 1921 and 1922. Um, please take a moment just to click on this link. I know I shared these slides on Google Slides with um, you guys. Um, so please take a second just to look at the famine results. Um, it, it was a pretty horrific famine, um, and there's some great information on that link, um, this link up here. Um, so please make sure that you click on that. Um, it's really helpful. So one of the biggest problems was that um, or one of the things that kind of mystifies a lot of people is why was there such a massive famine? Russia has so many resources. Um, it's such a massive country. We've talked about how it covers eight different time zones, um, right from Siberia all the way over to being part of Europe. Um, it's pretty amazing. So how could there possibly be such a famine? And there were a lot of different causes of the famine. Um, they had just been through seven years of war um, from World War I, and then there was the Russian Civil War. Um, they never went through a second agricultural revolution. We talked a lot how, um, because they in part, we talked about a lot of the factors that led up to the British Industrial Revolution, and one of the things that led to their population boom was the fact that they had enough food to feed that population boom. Um, but Russia never had that. Russia never went through that second agricultural revolution when they started, they never started to use machines in the fields. Um, most of the farming in Russia at this time was done by hand, which meant that they couldn't really mass produce a lot of farmed goods. Um, so that was a big problem. Um, and especially when they lost much of their young many of their young men to the war, that left most of the farming that was done by hand to women and children and older people that were left behind. Um, and then in 1921, there was a massive drought um, that led Russia's total crop yield um, in 1921 to be half of that in 1913. Um, so altogether, that is pretty bad, right? You've got war, then you have... Um, kind of poor uh, efficiency of production, and then there's also a massive drought. Uh, as you saw in that link that I just referred to, government officials in one town started advising starving residents to dig up the dried bones of animals, grind them into flour, and bake a bread substitute that has a nutritive value of 25% more than rye bread in spite of its unpleasant smell and taste. The consumption of these ersatz foods killed many, as did epidemics of diseases like typhus, typhoid fever, smallpox, influenza, dysentery, cholera, even bubonic plague. The movement of desperate and starving people helped transport these diseases around Russia because people said, look, we have to go somewhere to find more food, and then they brought diseases with them. So overall, this was a really dark time in Russia's history. And this is where we talk about, we see the rise of Stalin, right? So Stalin shows up um, and he lived from 1878 to 1953, but he really took over and, and started gaining in power around 1928. Um, and this is where he had forced rapid industrialization that ended up causing the worst man-made famine in history. Uh, he had this cult of personality where um, pe many people had pictures of Stalin in their home. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the propaganda that was used to make Stalin feel, um, or people feel as if Stalin was the father. Um, he referred to the Russian citizens as his children, um, and I'll cover that a little bit more in a second. Um, but he had this massive cult of personality. And you can see this, this portrait of Stalin. Um, he's kind of looking deeply into um, the soul of the viewer. Um, and check out that awesome mustache. Um, there, um, he forced this rapid industrialization through a series of five-year plans. Um, these were plans where um, they established quotas for um, production, and we talked in class a little bit about some of the parallels that you'll see to 1984 um, here through his five-year plans. Um, but these five-year plans set really unrealistic quotas that were just impossible to meet. 
And then there would be this uh, government propaganda that would say, we've produced this many chairs, you know, 60,000 chairs this month. Um, but those are really unrealistic numbers. And what we found was that because they were so unrealistic, because there were certain limits on the resources that were provided for those chairs, right? We talked more about this in class, uh, that this was a problem that the, the, the factory leaders, in fact, would start lying about how many chairs that they had, in fact, produced. And then the government would go forth and say, we've produced 60,000 chairs this month. When really the factories had not produced 60,000 chairs, they'd maybe only produced 2,000. And the people, the average workers kind of knew that, but it was propaganda. If you doubted, if you verbalized your doubts about the propaganda, um, oftentimes you were killed or there was the secret police that helped to enforce um, any of this propaganda. So if you were heard speaking out against some of the that what? We didn't produce 60,000 chairs. We only produced 2,000s. Um, next thing you know, the secret police would show up at your door and perhaps you'd be imprisoned in one of the gulags. Um, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, so one thing to note, um, even though these are called five-year plans, they sometimes didn't actually take five years. Uh, which is very confusing. Um, some were successfully completed earlier than expected, while others failed and were completely abandoned. Altogether, during the reign of Stalin, there were 13 five-year plans, and the initial five-year plans were created to serve in the rapid industrialization of the Soviet Union, so they were really trying to catch up um, to the rest of Europe, because the rest of Europe, or much of the rest of Europe, had gone through the Industrial Revolution, and so they placed a major focus on heavy industry. The first one was accepted in 1928 for the period from 1929 to 1933, and that was completed in four years, so completed one year early. And the last five-year plan was for the period from 1991 to 1995 and was not completed since the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991. So agricultural collectivization. Um, so this is what we um, how we talked about how the famine was kind of a man-made famine. Um, and in part, this is because of this procedure and this policy of agricultural cultivization, collectivization. Collectivization is this idea that farmland is forcibly donated and then multiple farmers run their holdings as a joint enterprise. In Russia, however, the state took control of the farmland, took all goods, and then redistributed it to the people, right? We've talked a little bit about how that is communism, right? So communism, um, everybody takes what they produce and you give it to the state. And then the goal of communism is, we've talked about how it's equality. Um, and so the idea is that then the government would take all the goods and then redistribute it equally to every single person. However, that did not happen. So what ended up happening is that the state did take control of farmland, did take all of the food that was produced, but then failed to redistribute it equally to the people. And this resulted in 30 million people dying from starvation by 1933. Imagine 30 million people. That's a lot of people. I know this is a lot of text. Um, I apologize. We're going to read this together, um, but I thought it was it was worth including. Um, so, as part of the first five year plan, collectivization was introduced in the Soviet Union by General Secretary Joseph Stalin in the late 1920s as a way, according to the policies of socialist leaders, to boost agricultural production through the organization of land and labor into large scale collective farms and kolkozy is the Russian term. At the same time, Joseph Stalin argued that collectivization would free poor peasants from economic servitude under the kulaks, wealthy, prosperous farm owners. So just gonna, a little side note. Prior to this, um, the poor peasants served, they were serfs, so they um, had a different system, and Stalin was saying that this would actually provide them with more opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't really happen. Stalin ended up resorting to mass murder and wholesale deportation of farmers to Siberia in order to implement the plan. 
Millions who remained did not die of starvation, but the centuries-old system of farming was destroyed in a region so fertile it was once called the breadbasket of Europe. The immediate effects of forced collectivization were reduced grain output, so that's where we saw the protests about bread, and almost halved livestock numbers, thus creating major famines throughout the USSR during 1932 and 1933. In 1932 and 1933, an estimated 11 million people, 3 to 7 million people in the Ukraine alone, died from famine after Stalin forced the peasants into collectives, and thousands of eyewitness, eyewitness accounts made by the survivors. It was not until 1940 that agricultural production finally surpassed its pre-war levels. So this is a map of where the gulags were. And gulags were Soviet work camps. And basically, um, this is what happened if you got kind of sent to prison. So if you were caught um, either speaking out against the government, or if you were um, a farmer who refused to um, collectivize your, uh, your land, you would be sent to one of these Soviet work camps. And I just want you to look at how many there are. There's a, quite a few near Moscow, and you'll notice there's not that many in Siberia, or in this part of Siberia, but there are many down here. Gosh. These are some pictures of what the gulags looked like. Um, they were, when we, they say labor camps, they're not kidding. This was, if you were sentenced to hard labor, it was really horrible. And oftentimes people would just disappear. If you got sent out to one of these labor camps, um, chances were you weren't coming back. Again, um, that should ring a few bells with 1984 once again. So the hammer and sickle um, is the uh, communist symbol, and you'll notice it uh, on the communist flag. Um, the, it symbolizes its leading role in socialist society to unify and enlighten the workers and peasants in the building of communism. Um, so a sickle is this tool here. This is the handle, and then this is the blade. Um, and this is a farming tool that's often used to cut grass or cut wheat. Um, and then this is the hammer um, down here. And, this, and the hammer is um, supposed to be industry. And then um, the sickle is supposed to be farming, and it's the idea uh, that it's, it's representative of the working classes. So here are a few quotes from Stalin, um, and I just want to run through these. They give you a really good sense of what Stalin was like. Uh, we'll start with this one up on the top left. Um, the death of one man is a tragedy. The death of millions is a statistic. We're going to move down here. Ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? The way to handle people is to treat them like chickens. Take away everything they have by plucking their feathers and then throw them a few breadcrumbs. They will then follow you forever. Death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problem. So think about those for a second. Um, each of these show a kind of a different aspect of Stalin. Um, in fact, I'd like you to just pause the video for a second, um, pick one of these quotes, and just reflect on it a little bit. Um, why, uh, what does, what does your quote show about Stalin's personality and his need for control, right? What does he want to control? For example, this one down here about the ideas, why would he want to control the ideas? And does that sound again, familiar to maybe 1984? So go ahead and pause the video here and just do a quick journal, just a few sentences and pick back up whenever you're ready. So one of the greatest tools that Stalin had and many authoritarian leaders use or totalitarian governments use um, is propaganda. 
And you'll see here, just take a moment to look at these pictures before we talk. Um, this one shows uh, Father Stalin surrounded by adoring children um, who are uh, giving him flowers and, and looking cheerfully up at Stalin. And you'll see he's got these smile lines. He looks like the kind father who's looking down at his children. Then moving down to the left corner here, you'll see here we have troops and the Stalin youth are down here, um, marching in line um, cheerfully. And then here's Stalin with, he's got planes up here um, and lots of red. You'll notice the theme of red in all of these for the Communist Party. Again, over to the right, um, you have Father Stalin looking down at his cheerful subjects or his ch cheerful children. And what you'll see is that the Soviet press constantly praised Stalin. They described him as great, beloved, bold, wise, inspirer, and genius. It portrayed him as a caring yet strong father figure with the Soviet population as his children. Sound familiar? Big brother, big father. Interesting. Here's a few more. Um, this one I find up on the left is particularly interesting because it shows lots of people. Like, look at all these different people. Over here you have um, these big skyscraper buildings, so these big symbols of industrialization, right, and, and the industrial five-year plans. And then look at the diversity of the people down here. And remember, Russia is huge, right? And um, we've talked a little bit about the Mongol Empire and how the Mongols um, invaded Russia at one point. Um, so Russia has quite a diverse population. Um, but this is really interesting. It shows not only the diverse population down here, but then you have Stalin raised up, right, seeming quite tall. Um, and he's got his hand up in the air and behind you have a picture of the world. And look closely at what parts of the world are represented here. And then look here at all of this industrialization, all of this metal, metal work here. This is really fascinating that you have Stalin kind of controlling all this, this vast empire with this great majority of people. And they're all looking adoringly up at Stalin. Over here, you have a similarly diverse group. Um, here, this is interesting because you have Lenin and Stalin. Uh, and then you have, again, a very diverse group of people all smiling and looking up at their, their great father. And all different industries. Right here, we have a pilot, maybe a military member. This is a military guy. This guy, he's got a, a flashlight on his head, so he looks like he's a, a miner. Um, you have a sailor here, so it's saying kind of, and then here's a young um, member, a, kind of a, a soldier in training. Uh, and this was one of the strategies that they used. They um, had some kind of brainwashing of young kids. So oftentimes young kids would be selected, really bright young kids would be selected and they'd be put into these special schools. Um, and in these special schools, they'd be kind of brainwashed. They'd be told all about how wonderful Stalin was. Um, they'd be literally fed propaganda. Um, oftentimes with few very useful skills, everything revolved around propaganda and the state. Um, and then they would be um, encouraged to kind of turn against their parents and their family members and their neighbors. Um, and they would kind of listen to their conversations. And if they ever heard anything that could be suspect, that they could report back to the secret police, they would do that. Um, and then down here you have Stalin with this beautiful, healthy-looking baby. And what we know now is that during this time, you had massive famine. So the babies that were being born did not look like this, right? We saw that in that link that we looked through. Um, in fact, some of the kids were even being uh, cannibalized uh, in that link, which we looked at at the very beginning of this film. This is interesting. Um, this preys upon the idea of fear. 
right? Um, so this was a, a propaganda poster that was um, shared, and it says, be vigilant uh, in Russian. This was a communist slogan urging people to be wary of other people. Um, so uh, be careful, right? Be careful against unpure thoughts. Be careful against people who want to undermine the government. Be careful against um, people who uh, are doing things that aren't in the country's best interest. And you had this, this secret police that would really enforce that. And people would be encouraged to turn against each other, each other um, to and report each other to the secret police. Um, oftentimes minorities were targeted, um, and uh, when people were starving, it was really hard not to talk badly about the government um, when you're starving and uh, don't have enough food to eat. Uh, so this was a little bit tough. Um, it was a tough time period. Again, hopefully this is really ringing some bells with 1984. So this is, um, I want to just look, I've got a couple of um, examples here of primary and secondary sources. Some deal directly with propaganda, but these are some direct quotes from Lenin and some ones from 1984 that I thought would um, draw some great parallels. So I want you just to read this and then try to answer the questions below um, in your notes. This is really good practice. Um, and again, some of these types of questions might come up on the test. So it's really good for you to practice this and then come to class next class with your answers and we'll review the answers to these. Okay, so um, read the following primary secondary sources and answer the questions. We know very well that there are still many defects in the organization of Soviet power in this country. Soviet power is not a miracle working talisman. A talisman is like a good luck charm. It does not, overnight, heal all the evils of the past. Illiteracy, lack of culture, the consequences of a barbarous war, the aftermath of predatory capitalism. But it does pave the way to socialism, it gives those who were formerly oppressed the chance to straighten their backs and to an ever-increasing degree take the whole government of the country, the whole administration of the economy, the whole management of production into their own hands. This was a, co a quote from Vladimir Lenin in his What is Soviet Power, which he wrote in 1919. So I'd like for you to try to answer what is Lenin's primary argument about socialism? And what is he trying to accomplish in this speech? So go ahead and pause the video, um, answer that in your notes, and we'll go over that next class. And I'm going to move on to the next quote. Oh, actually, one of the things, um, you'll see often these criteria, these characteristics of propaganda. Um, and you see, you'll see this in North Korea, you'll see this in... Um, in Russia, so a stall in Russia, and you'll see this in uh, 1984, hopefully. But um, the, most propaganda has elements of, um, or a message that there's prosperity due to government policies. So the government's kind of taking responsibility for um, good conditions, which sometimes the conditions are not actually good in reality. The threat of some sort of enemy Right? You saw that in that last poster. Right, Be vigilant against some sort of maybe internal enemies, like people who might sub, you know, stop the country from achieving its goals, or external enemies like those horrible capitalists. Right? Um, you'll often see things, um, propaganda talk about the glorious achievements of this society, right? Our society is wonderful and the best society, right? Which kind of leads to a sense of nationalism sometimes. Um, where this gets tricky is that sometimes the achievements are not so great. We know now that much of the population during Stalin's reign was suffering from famine. They were starving to death. And yet there was propaganda going out at the same time that says, look at the glorious achievements of this society. Look at how many chairs we've produced, right? Look at the quotas that we've achieved, whether or not those are true. There's often some subversion of the individual in favor of the collective state. And what that means is you suppress the individual, um, the, the individual person, because um, it's for the good of the country, for Russia, 
right? Not for me as a person, but for the good of Russia. So people starved. They worked hard in the field. They gave up their food for Russia, but they gave up their individual needs. And then there's also historical grievances as a basis for rule or violence. So it's saying that, you know, the bad, there were bad things in the past. You saw that with Lenin's speech a little bit. He says, you know, the, the, there were these bad conditions for the peasants under the kulaks, but now with socialism, uh, that my policies will help um, promote equality for the people. And that wasn't really true for the average peasant. Okay, here's another quote. Every year, fewer and fewer words, and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. All real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll exist only in new speak versions. And this is a quote from George L. Orwell in 1984. And I want you to think about the question, why is language a threat to totalitarianism? So let's go ahead and pause this video and see if you can answer that in your notes. Why is language a threat to totalitarianism? Okay, and the next, this is also from 1984. If the party could thrust its hands into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened, that surely was more terrifying than mere torture and death. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. George Orwell, 1984. So I want you to think, why is history a threat to totalitarianism? Why is history a threat to totalitarianism? So go ahead and pause and just reflect on that. The party told you to reject the evidence of, of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard, water is wet, objects unsupported fall towards the earth's center. He wrote, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. George Orwell, 1984. So I want you to reflect on what strategy of totalitarianism is being described here. Okay. And then um, for homework, you watched um, those two 60-minute videos about North Korea uh, and the reigns of uh, Kim Jong-il, um, Kim, Kim Il-sun, and Kim Jong-il. Um, so I want you to see if you could um, uh, reflect on those, or sorry, Kim Jong-un as well. So reflect on those, and I want you to just do a little bit of a comparison um, of, between North Korea today and 1984. Um, and then the differences to 1984 as well. And that uh, is how I'd like to close today. So um, what we're going to do with picking up next class, we're going to be talking about thesis statements and outlines um, for your research papers. And then um, you'll have a little bit of time to meet with your groups to begin planning your propaganda film. Your propaganda film is going to be due on the 27th, which is next Monday. Um, and you'll have class on the 22nd to work with your small groups on that. Um, your script is going to be due on the 22nd, um, so plan on that. You'll probably also need to do some work outside of class um, towards the end of next week, so on the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Um, so please plan accordingly for that. I'm really looking forward to seeing propaganda videos. Uh, I think they're going to be great. Can't wait. See you then.